All right, well, we are about to get started. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Akshita Puram um, from Smart Bear, and today we also have... Uh, Gregory Hansen, Director of Pre-Sales here at Smart Bear. Today we're going to be discussing six ways to measure the ROI of automated testing. So really looking forward to it, really looking forward to getting started. Just a quick introduction um, uh, on both of us, as you can see, some pictures. Uh, are we live on video? No, we don't have webcams going today, but I promise you those are not stock images. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So today we're gonna to be discussing a series of things, but we wanna make sure that we leave you with a couple key ones. One is the fundamentals behind creating a compelling automation business case. The other is six ways to actually measure and build out that business case of for the ROI of automated testing. And the last is the creep key criteria needed to create a successful transformation within your organization. So to really deep dive into those areas, we created two chapters here. Chapter one is actually the business case, looking at those inputs, those ROI gains and investments. And then chapter two is that transformation management. How do we make that magic happen? Yeah, and as we're going through everything, please feel free to type your questions in. I'll be monitoring the chat. So if you have questions, we will dive into them. Uh, like we already have one about metrics needed to measure ROI. We're going to get into that during the webinar today. So, and I, I think we'll also be presenting this afterwards so you can download a copy of the webinar. Is that correct? I'm, I'm getting nods from the, my handlers here. So yeah, I think we're good to go. Absolutely. So don't feel like you have to furiously take notes. This will, this information will be provided to you um, afterwards. So to get started, you know, many of you are familiar with the iron triangle which is a great way to kind of look at how to be successful um, in your quality assurance team. So right now in today's market, you know, you see a lot of demands for frequent release cycles, managing, managing infinite combinations of devices and creating standardization has really put a lot of pressure on delivery times. There's trends such as automation, continuous um, testing, integration, DevOps, and overall new technologies are forcing increases in quality standards by being able to do more with less. And meeting all of these demands while still keeping costs low or optimized is the third important element for software delivery. So, you know, it'd be great to hear from all of the people in the, in the chat, but where are you guys spending the most time? What is the biggest concern for you? Is it the time, is it the quality, or is it cost? Yeah, and one of the things that I've seen while we're waiting for some uh, chats to come in is it's always the the push and pull of we have a thousand things we need to do this week so we don't have time to implement automation which will save us time in the future i like that old comic strip with the uh, the guys pushing the trolley that has square wheels and there's a guy with a circle wheel and they said no we're, we can't be, deal with the new product right now we're too busy pushing this square wheeled trolley mm -hmm. absolutely so it's, it does look like there's a lot of time and quality that people are mentioning um and that tends to be the priority i think that we see a lot of you know, you, in the past, we've seen a lot of people having the need to take trade-offs between these three elements. But with these new accelerations and these new trends that are in the market, um, especially around automation and continuous testing and DevOps, one of the things that we find is that you actually don't have to necessarily make those trade-offs. There is a way to accomplish all three um, and, and be successful with your delivery and your software delivery. So let's go ahead and start it. The, you know, in, in general, for automation or, or ROI, this has put a lot of pressure on businesses to always deliver the latest feature as quickly as possible and with no issues. And more and more companies are exploring new ways of working and accessing that ROI to see if the change is worth it. Absolutely. Yeah. You want to be getting the new stuff out, but hey, we can't take time away from getting the new stuff out to improve on what we're doing today. Mm -hmm. You know, chicken and egg. And the return on investment of ROI for automated testing evaluates its performance really by dividing the net benefit from gains that we see in speed, quality, and cost saving, and divided by the net investment your team makes in tools and resources. So one of the questions that was mentioned early is what are the metrics that really define the gains and the investment? And that's exactly what we are going to go through. But before we go ahead and do that, we want to make sure that you are familiar with the common ROI pitfalls so that as you are defining this for your organization, you are aware of them. And that's usually around two biggest buckets. One is 
only accounting or exclusively account accounting for certain elements or not accounting for certain elements. So those that you know only account for creating and developing automated tests versus manual tests, that's not, there's so many other benefits that come from automated testing that we should and you should also account for when you are calculating your ROI. The other, other element is not accounting for the percentage of tests that have to stay manual. Absolutely. Yeah. You're not going to be able to automate any, uh, everything. Anything would be, it would be a poor webinar if I said you can't automate anything. Mm -hmm. uh, no, you're never going to be able to automate everything and you shouldn't strive for that. You should strive for automating the items that should be and can be automated to save you time. Because uh, what I always say with uh, computing, hey, yes, your computer can do that. It just depends on how much time you're willing to invest in it. And there's just not going to be that ROI on automating. Does my website look nice? versus can I log into my website on all the different browsers? You know, mm -hmm. there's that, that push and pull on it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. The other elements is not syncing your automation tool stack with organizational capabilities. We want to make sure that not only is that there automation knowledge within your organization, but also product knowledge or vice versa. Not only product knowledge, but also that you have the automation knowledge and you have the tools capable to do that. Or not accounting for test maintenance as an ongoing process. Creating the automation is one element of it and developing that and executing it, but then maintaining it is, should also be accounted for within your ROI. And then also looking at ROI over a period of time. This is not an investment for just one year or two years, but you want to look down the line and see how this is going to benefit your, your organization in the long run. So something to keep in mind in addition is that not every organization, industry, and QA team is the same, but how you define and execute and maintain your tests can vary. And after talking to a series of QA managers, there's some key variables that have been surfaced that really make each organization or most organizations unique. And those key variables are, come down to a couple things. One is, the looking at the requirements that need to be implemented within your organization and the test cases that you have for each of those requirements. Also, percent of tests that can be automated. Greg mentioned earlier that, you know, not everything is going to be automated. There are some tests that are going to stay manual and you have to be aware of what that actually means in your organization and what those tests are within your organization as well. Also, test case complexity. This can be, you know, going, you could create an automated test in about, um, you know, just a matter of minutes or hours, but then some tests can take, it's highly complex, can take weeks as well. Test cases of prior requirements for regression testing. So when you are investing in automation testing, you also want to account for, hey, what are those regression tests that we should automate to make sure that we are ensuring application stability um, as we with every new build. And then also the number of configurations to be tested. Do you guys participate in parallel testing? And is that an ROI variable that wants to be, that you want to include? Yeah, and of course, this isn't the exhaustive list of all variables that you need to keep in mind. Uh, you know, we had uh, someone observe, you know, what about the time it takes to analyze the test results for your automation? It's because yes, you are going to get failures in your automation and that then has to trigger someone to validate that the failure is an actual failure and not just failure of automation and then you need to make sure okay well now we need to figure out we found a bug what are all the different ways that we can replicate that and now we have to build more automation to capture those different use cases so there is a lot out there but remember if you try to if you try to eat the entire elephant at once you're not going to do it you do it one bite at a time So let's get started. Oh, and you know, you want to make sure of thinking about your organization, what makes your organization very unique. Well, so moving forward. It's probably eating elephants. Yeah. That would make any organization <laughs> unique. Also, let's start with chapter one, the business case. And this will go into the metrics that we have. So the six ways to actually measure ROI. So let's go ahead and get started with the one that, that everyone is looking at today, which is the standard looking at what it takes to automate your new test cases. So 
When starting out with an ROI assessment, the most common input is very much this, the time it takes to develop, execute, and maintain an automated test. And when we execute, what's involved in that is also the time it takes to even analyze those results that are coming out of that execution versus a manual one for new cases to run each year. When folks are actually looking at this, you know, we can't emphasize enough that it's not just manual versus automated, but you have to account for the tests that will also and should stay manual or exploratory. You also want to factor in the members that will conduct both manual and automated tests. When I spoke to a QA manager just a couple of weeks ago, they were talking about how they were hiring automation test engineers and that when they do hire an automation test engineer, they don't hire them to start doing automation and creating these automated tests in day one, but they actually tell them that, hey, you know, let's have your organization, let's have you wait six months so you learn the product and then you're going to start doing automated tests. So you want to account for that, like how much time or of their time are you going to allow to create automated tests versus manual? And then the next is don't stop there. We want to not just take a look at automated versus manual, but all the other benefits that you can get from automated testing as well. Yeah, and this uh, kind of a, a sideline to think about while you're thinking about those new test cases, what to actually tackle. Uh, very often I see people getting into automation and the first thing that they do is say, perfect, I've got these tests that I hate doing. I'm going to start automating those ones because they take me forever and they're very complex and I don't want to do them anymore. And those are the ones that typically can't be automated very quickly. So uh, a thing to keep in mind is take a look at the test cases that are those standard repetitive tasks that need to be done because those will be able to be automated very, very quickly and they will begin to save you time that you can then invest in more automation. It's that snowball effect. So don't try to take the biggest test case that you have. Take those small ones that can be just repeatedly done in all of your different configurations and uh, deploy those out. So it will give you more time to build that other automation. Because again, the entire reason that you're trying to build an ROI case to do automation is to prove hey, this is going to save us time and money. And if you can actually save yourself time in the beginning to do more automation instead of just banging your head against the wall for an hour, you'll actually get that traction. You'll be able to get off the ground with your automation framework. Mm -hmm. The second is the best practice, your prior test cases that you're essentially going to use for regression testing. So our IRI calculation looks at, actually converts every new test to be a regression test, and that it assumes that every new test will be a regression test. So here, you know, you want to make sure that you immediately integrate those automated tests, that you have a process in place to do that. Medium and high complexity test cases will receive the most value from automation. And in addition, make sure to account for maintenance of developed test cases as an ongoing process. Excellent. Yeah, that's uh, very true because, hey, while you are building these test cases, you are going to have to maintain them. So it's not the, the perfect world of, well, if I automate this 10 hours of tests, that's 10 hours I never have to deal with again. It is going to require maintenance and upkeep. So you always want to factor that in as well. So now let's look at the gains, where we actually get savings from. And so we talked about earlier how gains are coming from speed, quality, and cost savings. And you want to not just make sure that you account for automated versus manual testing and that and creating and developing and maintaining those tests, but there's more to the ROA. The first one is the most variable one. Not every organization does this, but coverage across environments. So what does the, if you are testing and doing conducting parallel testing within your organization, what is the cost of the lab? looking at the number of devices, the cost for lab maintenance, and then also if you don't or you should do this parallel testing across various devices and environments and configurations, and if you don't do it because of whether it's time constraints or cost constraints or et cetera, what are the defects that could go downstream due to the lack of the environment coverage? Because it is also more expensive to fix the de defects that go downstream versus earlier on in your development cycle. And then also the cost of a cross browser tool. Yeah, absolutely. Because if you think about it, the time savings is not necessarily going to be immediately because, hey, I don't have to do this test any longer. 
it could be, look, I'm still going to have to spend the same amount of time working on that automation item. However, now I can run it across 20 different environments that we weren't doing before. So I'm not necessarily saving myself time, but I am capturing those potential defects before they get released out live. And of course, we all know the sooner you catch a defect, the cheaper it is to fix. So it's not always that, hey, we're going to immediately save time of my testers right this second. It could be time of our development down the road or time of future uh, product uh, issues. And there are four types of there are four types of benefits or types of parallel testing that you can benefit from when you are conducting coverage across. Absolutely, because it's not good enough to just say, hey, it is working now on this one environment and it's done. You need to make sure that you are covering everything else. And that is where a lot of time does get sunk into testing in general. So I, I know I've chatted with a number of companies where they have the team split up and say, okay, look, we've got these hundred test cases and we need to run them across 20 different environments. So everyone boot up these different virtual machines or go into the lab and access them. And everyone's doing those repetitive tests over and over and over again. And if you are in a situation like that, where you have access to this big lab and you're able to do all of those tests, you will immediately see time savings by not having to go to each individual machine and run those tests manually, because you'll just be able to build them and maintain them once and deploy them across everything. However, if you don't have access to that, which is also very typical, people just aren't doing that level of testing because they say, look, I can't, I can't afford to build out an, an environment and maintain that environment and constantly keeping up with updates. I mean, I can barely keep up with updates on my one work machine. Um, I've stopped using my home computer just because I don't want to do the updates anymore. Uh, but yeah, if you don't have access to those, you want to look at, hey, is there a way that I can implement my automation that maybe also has access to run my environment, run my tests in multiple environments to help get me that coverage to save from that defect leakage? And that leads us to the next one, the most impactful one, because defect leakage is something that can not only occur from lack of environment coverage, but also lack of functionality coverage from, um, whether it's not having enough resources to do so or missing requirements in general. And you need to remember that the hours to fix downstream defects is far more expensive. And so here, it's really about finding those savings and those catching those defects earlier in, the, in your SDLC, in your software development lifecycle. So really what we want to emphasize in here is to test early. There's this new trend where, or a, a trend that you know, people are shifting left. And that's something to embrace to really reduce defect leakage. Yeah, you, the, the idea behind shifting left, it, and I was using air quotes there, but you couldn't see because we didn't have our webinar on, our webcams on, so I'll just broadcast it awkwardly that I was doing air quotes. Um, yeah, testing or shifting left means, hey, we're getting the testing in the process earlier instead of the traditional waterfall method of, hey, the stuff is all developed, we've got our product, let's now go test it. It's having the testers working with the developers at the time of creation. It's having the developers do testing while they are doing the development. Maybe they're building automation as well in line with it. So, you know, traditionally people would be building unit tests to test their individual functions, but now maybe those developers are also creating functional uh, workflow tests. Uh, so testing left, testing earlier, that is going to help benefit you. Uh, and uh, I mentioned it earlier, the, catching those defects earlier in the cycle is where you save not just a bunch of time, but uh, an impressive amount of money. Because I mean, we all, we've all heard those stories where there was one rogue regression test that didn't get updated, and then a known defect got re-released and cost everyone a whole bunch of headaches after it got out to the customer. So you want to catch those earlier in the cycle. And by having that automation framework set up to easily deploy across your multiple different environments, you have a much higher chance of catching those before your customers do. Because if you're, once your customers catch that, it's out. You can't, can't pull it back. And the next ROI measure to account for is the most underused one. And that's really around test redundancy and reusability. So we want to make sure that you, you want to have a good sense of the tests that were recorded twice or have similar components. Because there is a lot of time spent creating or duplicating efforts. So why, you know, rather than duplicate your efforts, or rather than recreate the wheel for tests that you have already spent time building, 
how can you find those tests and search for those redundant test cases? So the time to develop and execute redundant tests actually become, actually improve uh, your delivery um, times, uh, your testing cycles. So here, the best practice here is really to build modular test scripts, enabling test reusability. And in addition, to leverage a test case management tool to be able to search and duplicate test scripts or similar components. Yeah, this goes back to what I was talking about earlier, how often people will take a look at automation and take that one long workflow test that they have that touches every page in their application, and they will try to automate that. But really, the first thing that you should be doing is looking at your entire testing framework and saying, okay, what are those things that we do often? Things that, while they are tests in and of themselves, like logging in. But we log in in a bunch of our different tests, so maybe we should just build one login test that can be reused across. So I don't have to rebuild my login test for everything. I don't have to maintain 50 different or 100 different login tests. And also, if my login functionality actually gets changed, like maybe we add a security code or a, a third password or something, I'm not sure. All you have to do is update one automated test. So instead of going through and updating your 500 manual tests to add a new step for the login, you update your one automated test, which bleeds out across your entire framework. Mm -hmm. So uh, again, instead of jumping in head first to start automating, take a look at your entire breadth of testing and figure out what is the reusable thing that is repeatable, that is very time consuming. Automate those ones first. And the best thing about the tools that are out there today is that a lot of the main mapping kind of functionality where you store your tests can have custom fields and you can leverage those custom fields to make it specific or personalize it to your organization or your industry. That way making the search for these redundant test cases much easier. The last measure and is really the most forgotten one and that's the reduction of knowledge leakage. So an average tenure for a test engineer could be three years. Um, three to five years, depending on you know where they may be moving next. And that there is some knowledge leakage that does happen because it does take time to re-engineer those lost cases. And so one thing to keep in mind for this and to prevent this is to make sure that you have the you know really standardized, uh, personalized for your organization naming conventions for your test cases. But as I mentioned earlier, leveraging those custom fields in test case management properties or test case properties to personalize search for your organization. And the last but not least is to document, document, document. Having great process documentation and even test case documentation will help you prevent knowledge leakage from happening and time to engineer those lost cases. And also if you have good insight into those documents, you'll, you'll be able to figure out what tests maybe aren't important anymore. I've seen a number of people switching from large test management platforms to ones that are actually more useful for their team, more uh, amenable to what they're actually trying to do. And they say, look, we've got 50,000 test cases that we need to migrate over to this new system. And I always say, hey, let's take a step back and look, you have 50,000 test cases. Are you running all of them? Are all of them important? Or are you just like, and they look turned about, oh, you know, a third of them were just actually passing on through because that functionality doesn't exist anymore. So we're just marking them as passed so we can get through them. You know, take a chance to look at your tests and figure out maybe it's time to cull the herd a bit. So let's recap about the six measures, six ways to measure ROI that we kind of discussed just now. One, those new tests that you're automating. Regression testing. Coverage across, across environments. Defect leakage, test redundancy and reuse, and then knowledge leakage. So looking at these six measures, we want to hear from you. What are you guys doing? How are you all measuring ROI in it for automated testing within your organization? So we're going to have a poll come up very shortly. So perfect. The poll should be on your screen. And the question is, how do you measure ROI for automated testing within your organization? It's a multiple choice. We're getting some responses. I like it. Oh, it's, oh. it's trending towards 
Automation of new tests and regression testing. That's taken the lead. Followed quickly by test redundancy and reuse. It looks like covered cross environments is coming up in the last leakage defects. Are, oh, nope. Yeah, regression testing has now taken the lead. Oh, well, how interesting. I mean, that is not terribly surprising because if you think about it in a, in a manual environment regression testing, that is where you're going to spend the vast, well, if you're doing all of the testing the, the way you should be doing, then, you know, regression testing is uh, probably where you're going to be spending a lot of your time. However, I know that a lot of people just say, ah, let's just not do it. They just say <laughs> they're not going to do it, um, which is unfortunate because that's where you know, a number of defects also get out. Uh, looks like other is down there at the bottom and coming, <laughs> you know, in the middle around coverage across the, and the defect leakage. Okay, so a lot of really good uh, feedback from you guys on that. I am very intrigued by the other. Is there anyone wants to share in the chat about um, what other might be? Other was probably getting to leave work early. Or I would say uh, by early, I mean on time. Some people mentioned other was not doing ROI uh, analysis at all. Yep, oh. not currently measured. Ah, got it. Okay, great. Thank you so much. So moving on to the ROI portion. Let's look at the investment portion of it. So this is investment in tools and resources. So when we're looking at tools, you know, there's a couple of things that we want to take a look at. Yeah, this is like the normal things, for example, license costs of paying for that tool, annual maintenance fees, or customer service fees. But in addition to just looking at the tool itself, you want to make sure that you are assessing it for all its value. So want to make sure to take a look at time to value what does that ramp up time look like? Is it easy to use the tool and for your entire team to use it? Is there flexibility across all levels of experience going from non-technical testers to technical testers? And is there ongoing support that these tools have and resources such as this webinar or other webinars or other um, trainings that you could participate in? And then you take a look at resources. So this is, you know, very similar to the time to value, but the time required really to ramp up to speed with that tool. So you may have a series of resources and that can have, then there may be people who already have automation test experience, but then in addition, you may actually have people interested in going into automation te uh, test and want maybe automated test training. And so that growth and that investment that you put into resources can be organic or it can be inorganic. Organic meaning that, hey, it's organically occurring within your organization and you're investing in training. Or inorganic, you're going to hire um, test automation engineers. And those are resources and, uh, are, that you want to account for within your ROI. Right. And just because you don't have people either doing automation, uh, familiar with automation in general at this point, that doesn't mean you can't do automation because in, in general, my experience, everyone can learn to automate regardless of if you're brand new to testing uh, or you've been uh, doing testing and, and development all your career. There are many different tools available that allow people to get into testing, but you want to take these things into account. Hey, if I'm going to invest in a tool, one, can my team use it? Two, are we going to be able to continue learning how to use it better because uh, I don't, I don't think I have a really good analogy, but you know, you don't want to just get to the top level of something and say, okay, we're using 5% of our tool and then we're not going to ever get anywhere deeper. You want to be able to have a tool that you're going to be able to continue to learn, to continue to get more out of because every time that snowball goes a little bit further down the hill, it's going to get bigger. You're going to need to do more automation, spend more time on it. Mm -hmm. And so looking at this together, so far we've talked about, hey, the gains, the six ways to measure ROI. And in addition, the inputs that we actually take into account for when we're investing in tools and resources. And what that comes to is really looking at your ROI in an in over-encompassing way, looking at these sample results. And something that we emphasized earlier was not just taking a look at, hey, what those savings are today, but also looking at those savings a year from now, two years from now, and a couple years from now. In addition to kind of seeing year over year results or savings, you also want to take account for qualitative benefits. And that leads us to chapter two, 
which is transformation management. So we have all of this information, and now we need to figure out what we need to do in our organization to actually make this happen, to actually make this change happen successfully. And so to truly understand that, one second, it's moving on to the next slide. Um, there's really three areas behind every successful transformation when we want to move forward with kind of implementing automated testing within our organization. And that's around test, test approach, and your tools. So there's many initiatives that you can have. One of the things that we talked about when it comes to talent is looking not just about automation knowledge, but marrying that with in-depth product knowledge or having initiatives that help your organization create and promote an automation-first mindset. The second is looking at your test approach. You know, are we quickly turning around new test cases that we automate for regression testing? Or are there other test approach improvements that you want to make within your organization? And then the tools. Looking at tool, what are the tools that are easy to track your success metrics? Whether that be test coverage, looking at the test case results and analyzing those. All of those will lead to top initiatives that you want to focus on for your transformation. And then you take those top initiatives and you want to use that to map it across a roadmap. And here is a sample roadmap that you can leverage. The time frame at the top, there's three, there's, this is a three-year transformation map, but really the time frame at the top could be personalized for your organization on how you can change from a, your current state today to a future desired state. Here we've also divided it into talent, test approach, and tools the three T's that we discussed for a successful transformation. And when you map those top initiatives, you could see how it can be mapped in priority from a current state to future state. Here are some examples that you can leverage, but you're looking, maybe looking at hiring new automation engineers or doing automation training for organic growth, or looking at increasing the collaboration between QA and dev to really start shift, uh, shifting left or testing early. Some other ones around test approach can be standardization, naming conventions, creating some real-time reporting, and then to eventually do and practice successful continuous testing. And then with your tools, it could be around, hey, looking at, oh, we don't do automated testing right now. We want to make sure that our tool is up to par and we have the right features to make our organization successful. And marrying that with a test management tool and then conducting tools trading and then getting environment coverage into your organization and making sure not just your team adopts those tools, but though the widespread adoption occurs. And I know the, the three year thing, you, you have to think, wow, it's a long time from now. I mean, it's not really that far away. I mean, in three years, my, even my youngest two will be in school. So it's not that far away. And too often people will look at just the first year. They're going to say, okay, well, should we implement automation or should we increase our investment in automation? Well, let's take a look at it. Oh, we have to invest more in tools, training, time. Uh, well, no, we're not going to do that because we have to generate our 1,000 widgets this year and uh, on pace we're only going to hit nine, 900 widgets anyway, so we, we just don't have time to do it. But if you start looking at it in that longer term of, okay, well, to, next year we won't have to spend as much money on tool investment because it'll just be maybe a, a recurring maintenance fee. We won't have to do as much training because people already have a year of knowledge. And then instead of if there are training services you're paying for, we don't have to pay for those anymore because we have internal experts that can train on. Them. And then you get down into that third year where you've implemented your practices. You understand you have that framework built inside your system so that you can just continue expanding and growing it. You don't have to be constantly doing that massive upfront investment. So don't look at it from the one year point of view. Look at it and say, you know what? My kids will be at a nappies someday. Don't, don't think it's only nappies all day, every day for the rest of my life. In a couple of years, it will be better. I'm getting some nods from the marketing. I meant diapers. I'm translating <laughs> for, this is, the, this is the European audience. They'd, they'd understand that. So in addition to kind of just taking a look and looking at that transition, Let's say you do want to break it down into chunks and make it really tangible pieces. And that, yes, there, as, as Greg mentioned, this is three years, but there are pieces of value that you can get in the short term. And that's really what it comes down to when you're looking at a transformation charter. 
So let's say you take one initiative name and you want to see the value that you get from that one initiative. You can have a charter for each one of these initiatives if you really wanted to deep dive and express or share that executive summary with the rest of your team or with your executives or leadership or your manager to really show how this can improve your organization. So here you'll see various areas, whether it's the objectives and the benefits or business strategic alignment, but also an ROI analysis that you could see for just maybe that one initiative or success metrics that you want to take a look at or improve for that one initiative. So there are ways to kind of show value in, in bite-sized pieces. Yes, because again, if you're uh, on the last slide, if we're talking about, hey, let's just look at the big, massive three-year scope, you can lose that minutia. So when you're making the initial bid of we need to begin automation or invest in automation, take a look at some of those small strides that you'll make and say, look, in the interim, yes, it is going to cost us, but look, we're going to start seeing some benefits right away. And then those benefits grow as you get out. So you have to look at the whole spectrum. So now we also want to hear from you again and how you are. So we're going to open another poll. And this is really about where do you see the most improvement taking place? Or what areas do you want to improve the most to leverage automated testing? So we'll give you some time to respond. What area do you want to improve most to leverage automated testing? Well, the very first response was automation knowledge. So as we're getting more in, uh, clearly that is one area where you will want to invest time in that knowledge. And I'm probably by talking about this biasing the poll, but you know what? It's, it's my webinar. I can do what I want. Um, mm -hmm. No, absolutely. You want to be able to gain knowledge and improve. And I uh, personally, I come from an education background. I, I teach singing lessons. I love all that uh, stuff. I love growing uh, individuals. And one of the great things about implementing automation is the ability to improve your knowledge and skill in a useful part of your career. So you can also think of it from that point of view of, hey, look, we're going to invest in automation. We're going to be investing in our team and making them better professionals. And it looks like second place is actually processes to create automated tests. So that's, uh, and you know, I can see that as well. People saying, look, I want to get into building automation. I don't know where to start. I don't know how to create this in a reliable way. And so what we've done is also shared the poll results so you could see it on the screen as well. And then move it back to the presentation. We just wanted to recap everything that we went over today because we know that we gave you a lot of information to digest. So taking a look at about those learning objectives that we shared at the beginning, the fundamentals behind creating a compelling automation case. So we talked about the common pitfalls here, but also the variables that vary across organization that actually the inputs that you want to build into your automation business case. It's it, it really personalized for your organization, your industry, and your team. The second is those six ways to measure the ROI. We talked about the metrics that matter when doing this measurement, but also the best practices um, when Went wanting to improve these measures as well. The last but not least is the CRE criteria. We talked about three T's, looking at talent, test approach, and tools, and creating initiatives around those so you could really improve those various areas, and then create an automation or transformation roadmap and information tr and initiative charters to really help you and advocate for that change to occur within your organization. Absolutely. I mean, these are, uh, that's kind of, uh, what we just covered in a nutshell. I guess we probably could have just shown this slide at the beginning and then let everyone go very early. Um, but no, that's, uh, this is very important to keep a look on is, hey, how are we going to make a compelling case that automation is useful for our organization and going to improve all aspects of our job, our software, uh, even in our customer experience? And we know that this is a lot of information at times, and there's you know, six ways to measure ROI, but the best thing that we can offer to you to make this process easier is that we are going to be coming out with an easy-to-use online ROI calculator. And all of everything that we discussed here is, are going to be the inputs 
that will go into that ROI calculator that you can leverage dynamically. So we continue to have webinars and we hope that you've received a lot of value from this webinar itself. But we'd love to hear from you on um, suggestions on what other topics do you want to learn about. Feel free to mention in the chat if there's other areas that, that could be beneficial to you, as well as feel free to reply to the email that you received with this webinar invitation. We love hearing from you, we love hearing feedback, so feel free to share um, at any time. Absolutely. And uh, while you're dropping in your suggestions for other webinar topics that we can do, since we're still on this one, we might as well take some questions. Uh, and uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to type them in. Uh, I, have, uh, I, I have plenty of words that I can say, so hopefully some of those words will answer whatever questions you guys may have. Uh, one of the questions that did come in is, and this is a common question that everyone says, hey, we want to do more automation. However, we cannot hire more people. We do not have funds to train people. We don't have funds to buy the tools. And that is a very, very common issue. It's that testing just doesn't get the amount of uh, investment that it needs. And that's where these ROI calculators and ROI uh, investment ideas come into play. Because if you can start to make the case of, look, this isn't going to cost us very much in the beginning. We can start with a very basic automation tool, something that will allow us to do some record and replay, take some of those very generic regression tests that we have and repeat those so that it maybe just saves us a little bit of time. You don't have to say, I'm going to spend the next three years building a giant maintainable automation framework. You can just go to your boss and say, look, we have this 10 hour a month process. We can reduce that by just building a one hour automation item and then rebuilding it every month and save us nine hours. That nine hours we can then put into further testing. So if you can make, find that one area in, the, in your testing where you can say, look, if I can knock this out in automation, download a trial of a tool. I mean, obviously we've got uh, an automation, uh, we've got a bunch of automation tools here at SmartBear. Download a trial of one of those tools and tackle one of those repetitive test cases that you need to bleed out across a bunch of different environments. And then show your boss, look, with just a m small modicum investment of time, we can save ourselves X amount of hours. And that will start the conversation of, oh, okay, well, maybe we can put a little bit more funds into that. And then once you get that time savings, you can use that time for further automation, for further training. So uh, my advice is get an automation tool if you don't already have one and automate some of those uh, interesting little uh, tests that you have that can be repeatable and show, demonstrate that time savings uh, to your boss. And that'll get the conversation going. The next question that we got was, how can we calculate the ROI of automation in a project that hasn't had any automated testing, manual testing uh, project before? On what basis can we convince the customer that, that he will save money using automation? So this is actually the metrics that we discussed in terms of the benefits that you get from automation testing. Those savings are exactly what you need to is exactly what you need to kind of show that value, um, whether it's quantitatively as well as qualitatively. And I always am a fan of past demonstrations, past experience. Uh, if you are working with a, a customer and say, look, I recommend that we start with automation on this project right away. Let's not, let's not worry about building out everything manually and then transitioning to automation. Obviously, you're going to be building manual tests alongside of it. But if you can go to them and show a past customer or a past uh, experience where, look, we did everything manually and then we converted it to automation and this was the cost versus this is a company that we started with automation right from the get-go and how much quicker we were able to get off the mark. If you have those two benchmarks from previous experiences, that's a great way to help convince people because there are still a lot of people who say, ah, we don't need to do automation. But when you show them this is the benefit or you show them that you can always use a negative example. Look, these people weren't using automation. They wanted to go uh, with manual all the way and they had these uh, issues along the way. That, that's sometimes a little more stick than carrot works, but hey, you know, different strokes, different folks. <laughs> Another question that we got was, we have been, uh, we talked about how turning out the maintenance of the tool outweighed the savings, and they don't want to fall into this trap again, and you wanted to know any suggest suggestions around this. And my biggest suggestion here is that, you know, if you are spending a lot of time maintaining of the tool, 
the biggest thing that you could do, this is usually the case when you have very, very high complexity automation cases, and to really emphasize the creation of modular test scripts, really breaking down, looking at those common elements and that you can and really increase test reusability and uh, remove and reduce test redundancy for. And it's, it is, oh, I interrupted. I apologize. Oh, no, it's okay. I was just going, the last point I was going to mention was that if you spend more time creating modular test scripts and having those smaller test scripts, that you can identify the problem um, and the failure faster as well so that you can increase time for resolution. And it is always very possible that you just had a crummy tool. And that <laughs> does happen. There are, that, that is a thing that happens. And one of the ways that you can avoid that in the future is making sure that when you evaluate a new tool, don't, don't, be, don't, don't be spurned by the previous lover and say, well, that's it, I'm done. Look for other tools. Find a tool that you can get a free trial on. Look for a tool that you can actually use in your environment before you purchase it to make sure that, yes, this actually will work for us. And, you know, put, put the vendor through their paces. Make sure that they can demonstrate the value to you. Make sure that they can show you that they have ongoing support and training and maintenance so that you don't have to be uh, doing that maintenance yourself. And, you know, take a look at customer case studies. Look at people and, I mean, I vote whenever I'm buying tools, I always say, hey, give me a couple customers that I can talk to or I'll just find the customers myself so that they don't give me the, the preceded ones and ask them what their experiences are. I mean, any vendor that says, oh, I'm sorry, we're not going to let you talk to other customers. That's, you know, it's just like looking for a job. If they're not going to let you talk to any of the staff on the floor, you probably aren't going to hear good things from that staff on the floor. So, you know, look somewhere else. Another question that we have is, should we automate every test we can automate? How to test just enough? And Really, you want to make sure there is always, as we've mentioned multiple times throughout the webinar, but there's always going to be tests that you want to keep manual or should keep manual for exploratory reasons or for various other reasons. But in addition, you want to make sure that you prioritize your automation for tests that occur frequently, that you are spending time on an every build basis kind of repeating and really focusing on, for example, regression, your regression testing because those are tests that you are running for every bill that you have. And think about how much time it takes to actually run that test. Uh, because I, could, uh, I can most likely automate any test that, is hap that needs to happen. However, if I have a test that takes me, it, we, we do it across our team, takes 20 hours uh, total of testing time a month, it's going to take me five hours to automate it, absolutely automate that one. If I have those tests that takes one person half an hour once a month and it's going to take me 15, 20 minutes to automate it, you know what? If that person's interested in automating it, go for it. But if you're not going to see that massive time savings, then it probably shouldn't be tackled at the start. Uh, I mean, ideally, when you get down to the end of it and you've automated the vast majority of your things, you have more free time in your life and you want to automate some of those things to save yourself 10 hours a year, absolutely go for it. But if you start for the big rewards first, and, uh, you know, just kind of bleed down until you're forced to make those decisions of, well, the only test that we can automate takes us five hours a year. So I guess we will. That's a great place to be in. And if you really want to learn more about where should we start, what should we automate, the, and also the test automation tool uh, frameworks that are out there, we actually ran a, a framework series last year. Um, it was a three-part series. It was very, very successful. Highly recommend taking a look at the webinar recordings from that to really learn more about automation strategies and the frameworks that you can leverage to identify and prioritize your test cases. We can also send it to you um, as uh, when we send um, the information that uh, the deck from this webinar as well. Uh, now, now there's another question about a need to automate regression tests for sophisticated products where it takes a lot of time to process and create those tests. And there are applications like that where, you know what, it's going to, it, it's going to be the more heavy upfront investment. Uh, not every tool is going to be able to see the really big time savings of automating some of the quick regressive regression things. You may be able to get some of those. And, and don't think of it as, well, I need to automate all of these tests. You can think of them as, how can I assist my testers? If they have to do 
five hours of stuff before they can really begin testing. Can I automate that five hours of stuff that really isn't testing, it's just prep work. Maybe I can automate that prep work so that it's done by the time my testers get in and they can just get in and start doing what the tester's magic is and actually testing the application. So it doesn't matter if the application is completely super sophisticated and complex, you, you may not need to use an automation tool just to build those complex automation items. You may just use it as a prep tool. And of course, the more prep that you get done with it, you may find that you have more time to build automation and it will see that benefits in the two second and, and third year down the road. And I think so far we don't have, I, I think we've got all the questions. Now, of course, it, there, it, there is a possibility that we missed the questions or that I cherry picked them and I didn't answer. I don't, I think I actually got them all. I don't think I missed any. Um, we've got a number of topics on future webinars as well so that I will make sure to pass those off to the market. Well, there's marketing people here. I don't have to give them anything. They've already got it. Uh, but hey, everyone, I want to thank you for taking the time out of your morning, afternoon, evening to chat with us today and come, uh, come listen to us talk. And if you do have questions in the future, if you do have more information that you want to get out of automation, please, or just testing in general, please reach out to SmartBear. We have a number of people available here that are ready and willing to talk about how to help increase your testing practices. Uh, and as we're closing out here, I did get one last note that I saw before we close down the chat. Those, how much testing is enough? And you know what? Never enough. You're never done. Testing is always going to happen. It will always need to happen. We will never get to a point where we've done enough testing because once you've hit the day where we've done enough testing, well, I think we probably reached the singularity and then it won't matter anymore. We will be, we will be tested on at that point. Thank you everybody for joining our webinar and we'll make sure to follow up with some of the, um, with the content and the replay that we have uh, for this webinar. Thank Excellent. You. This was Gregory Hansen and Akshita. Hey everyone, thank you for coming. Look forward to next time.